Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 742. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's July 22nd, 2022. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the post-COVID edition. Kevin got the Rona last week, so uh, George and I are back here at the uh, the old studio. He's in Florida, I'm in Wisconsin, and we're going to bring you a show about Anglican news and Christian news around the world. And before we get started, how are you doing, George? Well, I had a heart procedure on Monday. I had a cardiac ablation. Uh, it's a two-hour procedure followed by about four or five hours in the recovery room, and I'm sore and itchy right now. They had to shave parts of my body, uh, but the uh, and my body's still sore from the surgery, but uh, I feel much better. Uh, the heart uh, heart uh, rhythm is normal, and that's wonderful. And they tell me there's a 95% chance that this is it that I don't need to worry about this anymore. Good. Uh, I got uh, coronavirus from the baby that uh, we been, we came to uh, Wisconsin to watch, uh, and so I got it. The mother-in-law got it, and uh, my only symptom is I'm a bit congested, and I have a positive test on the uh, the home test. Uh, I'm not sick. I didn't lose my f- my taste. Well, people say I have no taste, but I have not lost the, you know the ability to to smell or have flavor. Uh, I've not had any of the bad symptoms. It's just a, a minor cold, but it's still going on for ten days. And so I guess it takes a while well, to Ke- get the. Yeah, Kevin, it, this is impossible. Didn't you have two vaccination shots? <laughs> yes. It, it's funny I, I, I thought this was a. I thought this was a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Yeah, no. uh, in fact, my vax two, my booster shot, felt worse than the coronavirus. So I don't know. You know. And now, hold on, keep uh, Joe Biden in your prayers. The president now has COVID, so it's a very, uh, what's going on around right now is very catchy. You know, it's it's got a high... Dr. Fauci told me, I remember on TV saying, if I had these shots, I'd never catch COVID. It's only these poor, uneducated hicks who don't get vaccinated who catch COVID. And I'm a hick, you know, but I'm vaccinated. I'm a vax hick. I, you know, it, it is what it is. And I'm glad my symptoms are minor. I know a lot of people who, even people on Facebook who are friends, have lost their lives on uh, with this nasty virus. Uh, what uh, brother Monty Pitts uh, uh, passed on. So you know, it's it is what it is, and I'm I'm glad I'm getting it out of the way. I hope, please go. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the news. Uh, checking my show notes here. We have some synod updates. We were off for like uh, 10 days here, so let's uh, catch people up. The Church of England had a synod. The Episcopal Church had their general convention. And Australia had their synod. And I want to go quickly to the Church of England where conservatives are, are starting to take over some of the majority, especially of the Crown Nomination Committee, George. Yes, John Sandeman, uh, retired editor of Eternity News, the Australian uh, magazine, is a contributor to Anglican Inc. He had an op-ed piece where he noted that the Conservatives have a razor's edge majority in the Synod of the Church of England, meaning that the recent elections for, for, as you mentioned, the Crown Nominations Commission, which is the group that selects bishops for the Church of England, is now in Conservative hands. This is also true in Australia, where the Conservatives capture the majority of committee seats. It's absolutely untrue about the Episcopal (laughs) Church of the USA. It's a little too late for that. But it's interesting because the the, uh, momentum, the liberal momentum, may have been checked, may have been stopped. Now, on the Crown Nomination Commission, the selection of future bishops, the, the problem there is that the staff, is hard left uh, who basically prepare the paperwork can do all this stuff and the committee who chooses the people the staff gives them they're conservative so i don't know how effective this will be but the conservatives are winning in at least two of the churches in a political sense Mm -hmm. australia and england 
and which is a which is a it's man step, bites dog story. This is not is. something that we normally report. <laughs> no, it's something new and it's something uh, interesting. And but that's what liberals have been doing since the early fifties. They've been trying to get on these committees because being on these committees can set the future of the church and change things they don't like. And there's also a change of, I think, attitude, because for years and years and years, the left has been unapologetically rude and ungraceful in committee work and in synod work, attacking people. Uh, Andrea Minichilla Williams, who's not on synod this time, but in the past had been one of the few voices of uh, orthodoxy, uh, prominent voices who would speak regularly, would be booed and heckled. And it was always going in one direction the left attacking the right. Well, there are now some conservative firebrands who are willing to speak out, at least in the Church of England Synod. There's one fellow named Sam Margrave who's really been causing a bit of a ruckus. He complained about the Synod chaplain, a partnered gay man who uh, is chaplain of uh, St. John's College at Oxford. He is a chaplain. He's not a member of Synod. But he got up and gave a speech uh, objecting to uh, a proposal that pride flags not be flown at churches anymore. And this guy, the chaplain was beaten up for saying, look, you don't have a voice here. You're chaplain. You're supposed to be able and open and available to everybody across the spectrum. And now you're getting involved in the politics. And this fellow resigned. And today we have some Twitter uh, back and forth where Jan Ozan, Jane Ozan, the uh, leader of uh, the liberal faction, gay faction in the Church of England General Synod, uh, is being attacked for having a conflict of interest. She runs a charity that has a specific mission, and yet she speaks on this same mission in General Synod without declaring a financial interest because this charity pays her salary. Yeah. And in other words, this is stuff that only was in the past came from left to right. Now, the right is now using the tools that the left has used in the past to achieve political tactical victory. It's an interesting development. Yeah, a little, a little accountability where, you know, the, the, the right has never had the, uh, I don't want to use that word, never had the time <laughs> in the in past. Many, in many ways, it sort of mirrors the, the political world. For Americans, you know, Republicans were always happy to be smacked down and just be nice and play the game and then you had uh the alexandria ocasio cortez of the maxine walters waters you know being outrageous now we have just as many republican outrageous congressmen and congresswomen to match the outrageous democratic ones it is, yeah I, i've noticed there's like five or six wackos on, on the right that are in congress now and you know God well, bless them. They're, they're entertaining <laughs> wackos. They yes, they're entertaining they wackos. You know, it used to just be the liberal wackos, but you know, but there still are more liberal wackos here in America than uh, conservative in our Congress. Let's move on to some other news I got here. Uh, as we've mentioned before, Bishop John Guernsey is retiring, and they've announced new candidates for his position. So, who are they, George? Got the list up there. Yeah, I've got it. I'll just pull it up. Uh, three candidates have been put forward, David Hankey, Patrick Ware, and Chris Warner. Hankey and Ware are from the, within the diocese mm -hmm. of the Gulf of uh, Mid-Atlantic, and Warner's from South Carolina. And interestingly, the two fellows from uh, the Mid-Atlantic are uh, vicars or rectors of churches that were planted by the Falls Church. Um, I think that's an interesting development. Sure. Uh, we, yeah. we see the Falls Church, uh, you know, way back when everything everybody was still Episcopalian, they wanted to do this church planting in the suburbs, Virginia suburbs of Washington, D.C. And Peter mm -hmm. Lee was at first helpful, but then as the political world tightened up, he sort of backed away and pulled away uh, from supporting these plants. And now what we're seeing is that the Falls Church is... Uh, program of church planning has succeeded wildly very successful now the virginia suburbs are one of the growing areas of the country mm -hmm. but then but it's i think it's a little bit of massachusetts or new york that's in the south 
the Northern Virginia is not what it once was, uh, the Robert E. Lee land. Um, no. Yet these churches are growing and doing very well, and we're seeing two of these fellows standing for election. Elections in October, I think October 15th. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, but just exciting to see uh, growth and opportunity and uh, these these people coming up. My only complaint is that uh, only one guy looks old enough to be a bishop. The other two <laughs> look too young for me. Little whippersnappers. I mean, you, you and I are getting old, George, because everybody looks younger than me now, you know, except me. Wow. Yeah, getting old. Uh, let's move on quickly. Uh, David Old has posted a story uh, about Peru that is going to gather a little bit of interest. Um, thought we could talk a little bit about it because in Titus it says we need to pick bishops who are above reproach and that may not have happened uh, <laughs> down under so to speak uh, well not that part of down no, under the no, other down the, under the, but, our, our down under yes and that a bishop be a man of one wife mm -hmm. uh, normally that's understood not being divorced and remarried and in this case the accusation is Jose Aguilar the bishop of Peru is big is uh, is a bigamist uh, David Old, uh, you can see his story on davidold.net. We've reposted it with his permission on Anglican Inc. Has done a basically fantastic job of exposing something that I was totally unaware it was out there. No idea. Now, you hear, you hear all the time about bishops and their cathedrals not getting on and this and that and the other. And part of it, you know, I'd heard rumors and stories, but I basically was thinking, well, you know, the cathedral is more expats, you know, pe Americans and Englishmen, people uh, from a northern background living in Peru uh, with a Peruvian bishop. So there's going to be some conflicts between the Spanish language and the English language people. Didn't think anything of it. My mistake. It turns out that uh, the fight is harsher and nastier than we supposed. The allegation, and this has been duck, and these allegations are not wild speculation, but David Old has documented these allegations, obviously with the assistance of somebody in Peru, <laughs> Yes, uh, is that Jose Aguilar began life as a Roman Catholic priest, and he left the Catholic priesthood uh, shortly after he uh, got a woman, 17-year-old girl, pregnant. And he then went on to marry this woman in this civil ceremony. A few years later, he approached the Anglican Church and asked to be received as a priest. And Bill Godfrey, the Bishop of Peru at the time, accepted him and his wife. The problem was this wife was not the wife that he had before. And there was no evidence that the civil marriage was dissolved and so the accusation is that this man has two wives one he's abandoned and has to they had a religious marriage with the second woman he had children with both now the response is is just as interesting the response by the officials of the Anglican Church in South America is shut up uh, don't don't say anything that once you become an Anglican once you become a Christian your sins are forgiven you have a new life in Jesus Christ well that's well and good but still we have as you mentioned at the top of this the admonitions from Titus what we expect from a bishop and going from Catholic to Anglican isn't quite the same thing as going from atheist or no. pagan <laughs> to Christian <laughs> I know some of our viewers will think it is the same, but no, no I no, I, no. Uh, I can assure you it's, it's not, yeah. And there's, so, there's, rather than say, well, oh yes, here's the annulment, or oh yes, we knew about the, the, there's a circling of wagons. Uh, Greg Venables, who was called in to be the interim uh, dean of the cathedral in Peru, and he did it remotely from Paraguay, where he's living, uh, broadcast the sermons to the church from Paraguay, basically told the people to not argue, get with the program, this guy's your bishop, stop complaining. Mm -hmm. Now, we know Greg Vanables very well, sure. and he's no fool, and 
But at the same time, David Old has come up with some documentation, or David Old's researchers have come up with documentation that these aren't just the musings of some cranky parishioner who doesn't like the bishop. This is a serious allegation. And we'll see how the House of Bishops of the South American Church handles this. Because they are conservative evangelicals in South America. This is an issue that they can't slide on, like if it were in the Episcopal Church or the, or the uh, Church of England. They can't, no, you can't well, slide on. Yeah. If everybody knew beforehand and it had the full uh, support of the House of Bishops, that's one thing. But nobody knew. You didn't know. I didn't know. Um, you know, and part of this, if you want to have a very public confession and, you know, to restore yourself to the church, that's one thing. I don't see that here either. Um, I see something that has been, I want. I don't want to use the word covered up, but, you know, kind of nodded and winked through, you know. And so here we are breaking, you know, this news story uh, decades later when it should have been fully uh, disclosed a long time ago. Yeah, it's, to be frank, I don't like these sorts of stories no. because they, they, they dwell on human failings. Uh, for me, the more interesting part is the institutional failing. Did anybody do due diligence way back when? Or one of the problems the ACNA had early on was <coughs> that you got some people coming in as bishops who really shouldn't have been bishops. No, it is. Yeah. And thankfully, I think this problem's resolved itself with time. They've sort of either retired those people or those people have left the ACNA. Um, so uh, maybe in South America they had the same problem. They were so anxious to get moving that they closed their eyes to things that they shouldn't have allowed. It, a, a possibility. Um, I don't know. We'll, to, we'll to see how that story plays out. And finally in the news, next week is Lambeth 2022. Yay! George and I won't be there. We'll be uh, watching the video feed from afar, saving our viewers money, uh, saving our time, and not enjoying the heat wave in Europe right now. So last time I was in uh, at the last Lambeth was the last heat wave they had. And they, they don't have AC over there, George. The only AC we had was in the press room, and we wouldn't leave it. <laughs> so. Oh, my. We've, we're in the lull before the storm. Mm -hmm. But I... Uh, that's a wonderful cliche, yes. but <laughs> meaning that it's quiet right now because a lot of the guys are traveling. So we're seeing statements like the Church in Wales has put out a statement from their bishops. Uh, just sort of these, uh, you know, exciting, great together, the church can speak to the world, blah, 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 you know, this sorts of stuff. But there's also some discontent brewing and this is uh, sort of the inside baseball time. This Lambeth conference is built around a series of calls. A 31-page document has been prepared that will guide the bishops in their discussions, and the bishops will issue calls, which used to be called resolutions, uh, at the end of this process. And the calls are on a variety of topics ranging from the environment uh, to human sexuality. Well. The Global South Fellowship of Anglicans, led by Justin Badi Rama of South Sudan, and that's sort of the uh, organization, I would call it parallel to GAFCON, uh, hold the same basic theological tenets, but they're still willing to play the Lambeth games and the system. They're willing to, they want to work within the system, while Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda have said the system's corrupt. They have put out a statement saying, friends, Orthodox bishops, please reaffirm Lambeth 110, which is the Anglican Communion Statement on Human Sexuality, which basically has the, the two parts to it, which is that we cannot recognize uh, as licit same-sex uh, activity, while we also uh, welcome and we will not discriminate or preju be prejudiced against those who identify as homosexuals. But the big the point is that the gay stuff is a no-no. This, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans want reaffirmed. Well, 
this 31 page call book uh, that has been distributed to the bishops, which will gather, says, here's what we're going to debate on human sexuality, and we're going to vote, and we will either vote to affirm Lambeth 110 or vote to study it further. Now, this has caused an explosion. Justin Welby had a statement released this morning on the Lambeth Conference Press uh, website, which we've reprinted for Anglican Inc., which says, uh, these calls were put together after long study and you know this is what we're going to do but the left is saying hey wait a second there's no option to vote down lambeth 110 and we're do going through this process in the church of england uh for the living love and llf process where we might have uh, an affirmation of same-sex marriage and now we're being told that at the minimum if we get a study that's not going to happen because the Church of England is not going to go against the Lambeth Conference. So the liberals are absolutely livid. They're seeing the machine being turned against them and their desire to have Lambeth 110 chucked out being closed off by the administrative state out of Lambeth and Church House. So this is a remarkable occurrence and Kevin I have my ideas of why this is happening. What do you think? What's going on here? <laughs> well, the Church of England uh, is certainly uh, the host here and is more liberal than uh, uh, any province except maybe uh, Canada and uh, the Episcopal Church. But what's happening here is we, we always see, you know, that uh, we're going for a power struggle. And if we can get rid of that annoying Lambeth 110 once and for all uh, we won't have to debate it it won't be a part of our ethos and identity uh, there, that was a big victory uh, decades ago to have that in there as part of you know what Anglicans believe and uh, mm. to see now the fight over it uh, mm. decades later it's going to be interesting we won't lose it this time but maybe next if we're going to study it for 10 years maybe they'll, they'll erase well, it next time Oh, Kevin, do you really think Justin Welby is a firm believer in Lambeth 110? <clears throat> or is there something more? I, am I asking the question? I think there's something more. Well, I, I think, think that Justin, believer, Justin Welby is a believer in the institution. Is, he's an institutionalist, and, yes, absolutely. And kicking the can down the road for at least 10 years and keep... He's willing to preserve the institution as it mm. stands by sacrificing the left in the Church of England. Sure. The, the the call does nothing to the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church of Canada. It doesn't in any way hurt them. The only people it really hurts is the Church of England, mm -hmm. because they're the ones that want to move and follow the U.S. and Canada on the gay business. And now that door has been closed by the English bureaucrats running Lambeth. So well, what does I this tell us? Is it Justin Welby had a come to Jesus moment, or Justin Welby sees that? He can't afford to lose the Global South to GAFCON. I think the genuine uh, ethos of all this has been kicking the can down the road, doing the indabas. We'll talk about it. We'll, we'll continue to talk about it. And as long as we're talking about it, we're not divided, uh, in, is the belief of an institutionalist. And, mm -hmm. you know, Justin and Rowan before him uh, said, we won't divide if we continue to talk. Well, we divided anyway. We were done talking, we had decisions made, and we had the teachings of Lambeth 110 to tell us where uh, the Anglican Communion stood on this issue. And you, 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 as long as that's there, there's not much you can do about it. Well, they like people like to say demography is destiny. And I think part of the anger the liberals have is that if they don't win now, they're never going to win. Hmm because there's the the church is multiplying across the growing the developing world um, in uh, Africa Nigeria all these places the church is just growing it's stagnant in many places and in other places it's of active decline as I as we mentioned in our last show where we discussed the Episcopal General Convention Kevin Martin former demon the Dean of Dallas and a noted church growth expert is predicting 
that uh, the Episcopal Church will have half the number of bishops in 20 years because the half the diocese will have to be merged out of existence because they're they're Mormon, they're dying. Uh, and 20 years, the Church of Nigeria will have twice as many bishops in Rwanda, Uganda, Ghana, all these places. And if they, if the left doesn't get their victory now, they're never going to get it because the numbers are continuing to grow against them. Um, it's and even in the Episcopal Church, uh, though the though the institutions are stacked and so heavy on one side, the parishes, by and large, that are growing. And now I I will admit that there are some niche parishes. All Saints in Pasadena does well, sure. um, but. You know, the, the parishes in Hooterville, such as mine, are growing and they're vibrant and dynamic because Christ is proclaimed and we follow a very traditional understanding of Scripture and God's revelation to us. And over time, generations, we're, we're the ones producing children in our classes who will have more children, whereas the uh, you know, the, the left, the demography is against them. <laughs> the Volvo driving left is not reproducing children. No, I agree. Um, well, to see, <laughs> just like, I mean, you know, but, 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 but the, uh, as John Sandeman wrote, the conservatives won in the general synod elections in mm -hmm. England and Australia. We mentioned that already. I think the conservatives could come out with a win at Lambeth, but. That win really doesn't matter in the great scheme of things because I see and sense a shift in the global Anglican world. Now, this may sound heretical to some people, but if you look at the Anglican formularies, if you look at what makes Anglican dis Anglicans distinctive, what we believe, what we've always believed, what sets us apart from the Presbyterians and the Catholics and whatnot, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lambeth Conference have nothing to do with that. It, I mean, this is just an innovation since the Second World War. Uh -huh. And nowadays we talk about <clears throat> four instruments of unity and all that. Well, Kevin, you and I have been around long enough to remember that Lambeth Conference voted down the four instruments of unity. It did. No, yeah. they're not official. They said no. Uh -huh. And does Cramner talk at great length about the unifying place of the Archbishop of Canterbury and Anglicanism? He does not. He talks about scripture and faith and certain theological propositions. And this has been the draw, this is what the Jerusalem Declaration that Gafcon came up with is all about. The future, and uh, this may sound like a party political broadcast, but the future of Anglicanism really is within the Gafcon mindset may not be the GAFCON organization, but the path that GAFCON with the Jerusalem Declaration has plowed, that's the way forward uh, over the next 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah, because it, it puts form to function. One of the things that uh, the Church of England and uh, a lot of Anglican communion leadership and provinces have done is they've lost their form. They've lost their identity uh, by not having solid doctrine, not being unified when it comes to being pressed by the culture. And, you know, GAFCON stands up to culture uh, and shows, uh, you know, it's, it's a separated from culture where the Church of England endorses and uh, <laughs> sadly sometimes leads culture down the, the, the path of destruction. So... It's a, it's a what we have what we're living right now is through the time of the failures of men uh and what i mean by that is the reason why we have the global south fellowship of anglicans is that way back when john chu that then the archbishop of singapore mm -hmm. did not like gafka he in fact ha he had personal differences with the leaders of the gafka at that time it, Peter yeah. mm -hmm. and that personal animosity formed these two rival groups. Now, people will say they're not rivals anymore, they're working towards the same end. Mm -hmm. Well, they're still separate groups. And that's why, uh, if you look at the long term, once the, once the personal 
uh, animosities and jealousies and rivalries are all factored out and we move forward on what the understanding and the mission of these groups are this is where the growth is this is where the opportunity is this is where things are happening um i remember years and years ago uh i think it was uh i think was it columbus or denver i think it was the denver general convention rusty reno who's now an editor of first things magazine he was a delegate episcopal delegate from the diocese of nebraska he was still an anglican and episcopalian at that point mm -hmm. and at that meeting uh, i was talking to him and he says you know george she said to me george I truly believe the spirit has withdrawn from the institution of the Episcopal Church. Not from individuals, not from parishes, but from the institution. And he, here we are 25 years later. Rusty's gone his own way and is now a Roman Catholic. But I, I see that, that there's a great deal of truth in what he's saying. That the spirit is being withdrawn from some of the institutions that we've grown up with and are accustomed to in the Anglicanism and is alive and vital in others that we find very surprising. I remember three decades ago was the uh, decade of evangelism in the Episcopal Church. And I remember three decades ago, uh, one of the people in the front office was uh, indicted for spending $2 million that didn't belong to her. You know, a lot <laughs> has changed. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Uh, uh, well, she was a piker cook her name was uh, yeah. i forget her i want to say carol but it wasn't carol uh she's a piker compared to the thief at the diocese of london who stole five million pounds I know. so uh, uh maybe they just have had longer practice in the church of england of fiddling the books than uh, we in america have had so but it, yeah what i want to kevin if if i may sure make a personal point um the short term will be difficult um, for people who have a love for institutions, who have a love for things. But the long term is set and secure. God's, you know, moving in this world in remarkable ways. Hmm. And he's moving in the lives of people. I see that every day. Um, I, I, yesterday, I had my first real return to work after surgery, and I go gave a class and held a service at a, a nursing home and just to see the power of prayer and faith and hope in the lives of these elderly people many of whom are have you know life limiting illnesses and whatnot you know god is god is alive and is moving and then i think about the general convention and no, I don't. I don't see the Holy Spirit there. I see the Holy Spirit at the Grove Nurse Assisted Living Facility. Mm -hmm. I didn't see him at the Baltimore General Convention. No, and but I do see that spirit moving in the world. Sure, absolutely. All right, so we kind of a, a short episode. We got Lambeth news coming in our next couple episodes. We'll be talking about. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 742 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>